Are you here? <laughs> You're here, and that's what's important. Here. Here at the Paul Leslie Hour, we're honored to once again welcome pianist, composer, and record producer Michael E. Utley, the longtime musical director of Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefer Band. Mr. Utley first worked with Jimmy Buffett in January of 1973 for the album A White Sport Coat and a Pink Crustacean, and continued collaborating on stage and in the studio until Buffett's sad passing. This interview took place November 30th, 2023. Kindly support us, if you would, please, by liking The Paul Leslie Hour on Facebook and subscribing to The Paul Leslie Hour on YouTube channel. We thank you. Please share this interview if you like it. And with that, let's listen together. How are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just day to day. It's uh, it's quite a time, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's uh, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, he touched a lot of people's lives. <laughs> to say the least. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm hoping that you can tell also a couple of words about the late Fingers Taylor. He's such I a would, huge part. happy to. Yeah. What's your most vivid memories of the Harpoon Man? Uh, exactly that. <laughs> he was a blues man and he lived it. <clears throat> he, 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 uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, uh, I was uh, sitting in with Jimmy because um, I was working with Chris Christopherson and Rita Coolidge at the time. And Jimmy, they were doing a West Coast tour. It was one of the broken leg tours. Jimmy had a broken leg. Anyway, fingers in, we played Bellingham, Washington. So we decided to take the train down to Portland. So, but the train left at 4 a.m. So we stayed up for that departure and um we got on the train and you know just uh just kept on plugging away you know and uh got into portland about 10 in the morning and john lee hooker was checking into the hotel <laughs> fingers went up to john lee and his his lady friend and he went up to he said john lee fingers taylor you know he ended up being with John Lee until we went on stage at eight o'clock that night at the Paramount Theater. <laughs> so you can imagine what kind of shape uh, Fingers was in, but he played great. He was always on and, you know, but he was definitely a blues man. He was a kind, kind soul. Definitely a, a, a real loss to, to lose such a, a interesting person and a phenomenal musician. Exactly. Mr. Utley, you have lived quite an, inc an incredible life. If you, you know, uh, the past couple of days I've interviewed you now, this is the third time one-on-one. -on -one, and then the, that one time with Mr. Robert Greenwich years ago in, in Key West. And, it, you know, has there been anything that has surprised you about living life as Michael Utley? Uh, I never expected it to be. When I started this, I was uh, uh, just out of college. I was going to be a, I was uh, going to be a doctor, and a pre med major. And things happened that uh, I was able to do some sessions, or, uh, during a, a spring break. And found, yeah, I mean, I was always in love with music, but never w was going to do it professionally. And uh, I. Uh, decided that um, uh, that I'll, if I could just make a living even even, even if it was just playing honky tonks hmm. that would I, I would really love to be able to do that I, I need to give it a shot and luckily though uh, unfortunately that didn't happen that way I immediately got a job as a um, session player I did sessions in Memphis for about uh, six months. And ended up going to Miami to be a session player for Atlantic Records, 
in a group called the Dixie Flyers. And um, we, uh, I mean, we, I mean, this is six months out of college. I was playing with Aretha Franklin, Jerry Jeff Walker, Brooke Benton, Lulu, Sam and Dave, uh, let's see, uh, Carmen McRae, uh, um, let's think who else. Um, there was, um, well, there was other, there were other acts, but I can't remember exactly who all. Arthur Conley, mm. R and B, uh, R and B legend there. Um, um, but it mainly R and B uh, acts, and um, and I got to be around some really fine record producers: Jerry Wexler, Tom Dowd, Arif Mardine. Oh, Buddy Guy and Junior Wells. I forgot about that. <laughs> Buddy Guy, the blues man. Who uh, fingers took took uh, took uh, talking about fingers again? Took it. We played uh, a place in Chicago and came back in town and went to. He had just opened his buddy guy had just opened his place called the Legends, and saw uh, Derek Trucks there for the first time, which was great. He was new on the scene and he was amazing. And uh, but yeah, I I I, I couldn't have even thought about that because all I wanted to do was just play music. And if I could be a session player, that, that would be great at making a living playing music. And, but what happened is that I was able to expand a little bit and um, start producing and arranging and doing other things in, in music. And uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have, I never thought it would have been like it has been. Well, the very final Jimmy Buffett record, Equal Strain on All Parts. I think there's a, an interesting little connection, the way the album begins and the way it ends. It's a great record. I must congratulate you and, and all the musicians and, the, and your co-producer. But the album starts with Bourbon Street, New Orleans. Exactly. Close to home. And then it ends in an exotic locale, Mozambique, the Bob Dylan song. Right. It's kind of a, a, a cool metaphor. Well, it is, but we didn't plan that <laughs> at all. <laughs> Just like we didn't plan Volcano when it happened. You know, uh, we, that wasn't even written when we did that record. It, it happened because we were there on a volcano in uh, in uh, Montserrat. But anyway, to get back to, uh, yeah, it it... it Originally, we weren't going to start with uh, with uh, the University of Bourbon Street, but it was so apropos because that's where Jimmy started. And the song, you know, it, he and Will Kimbrough wrote a terrific song that sort of tells his his story of getting into the music business. And and uh, and uh, the Mozambique thing, uh, you know, he. Uh, he wasn't thinking about. He loved that song, and he loved. He wanted to do a duet with Emmy Lou, and she had done the original duet with Bob. So, uh, and she just happened to be in town when we were recording in Nashville. Uh, she was actually headed to um, a Dolly Parton session, the the new rock and roll album that Dolly <laughs> Parton did. She was going to be singing backgrounds on it. She says, "Well, I'll come by the studio." So it was like nine thirty in the morning. Um, and I'll, yeah, let's do it. And they did a tremendous job. Absolutely. And it, yeah. it looked looked like the studio was cold. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Everybody's wearing coats. Yeah, it was cold <laughs> in Nashville in January. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you think of the, the very final Jimmy Buffett record, Equal Strain on All Parts? You got to be in there up close producing it. What do you think about the last one? Well, I just think it, he was amazing. Uh, I mean, all these, I, I, if you hadn't heard, you know, uh, he uh, had, there were no songs, had no songs had been written. Uh, I mean, the first song was, the first song we heard was Fish Porn. Uh, little snippets of the, uh, snippets of the uh, song. Uh, th that was in mid December, and uh, of course Jimmy didn't. You know, he sort of started doling out uh, writers, and you know, Will and he wrote three three of those tunes, uh, 
And Mac, uh, I think, worked on maybe five, four or five. And um, uh, uh, Lenny Glott on a couple of them. But anyway, uh, it was just, it was amazing how Jimmy kept focused. And even though he was really ill at the time, I mean, he, we had known about his situation, um, his health situation for quite a while. And he had three years of really good uh, test results and everything. But he, in September of 2022, he, he, had, he was hospitalized. And so this is December of 2022. And he says, well, let's just do this album. And so he just started sending out titles and ideas and, you know, and, and melodies. And, and it's amazing because it was about the 23rd of January that we started recording and everything was written, you know, it's just, um, um, and he had the covers that he always does. He, you know, he always did two or three covers and makes those covers his own. Hmm. So what makes it, to me, that's what made him a great artist. To make, mm. you know, makes it. He sounds like he wrote that tune. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so uh, yeah, that is a very good point. I mean, there's some songs that people are surprised when they find out Jimmy Buffett didn't write "Lovely Cruise." He didn't write "Banana no. Republic," but he exactly. really he just nailed them. He nails them. Yeah, "Brown Eyed Girl." Yeah, I remember when we did that. You know, in uh, one particular harbor. You know, he said, let's do that. I said, okay, <laughs> but let's make it more rock and roll than Van did, you know? And um, just more edgy a little bit. And uh, and he nailed it. Mr. Udley, what do you think people can learn from Jimmy Buffett? Uh, to never get down keep pushing and keep going forward and keep focused on having you know going keeping occupied and creating i mean he never stopped he was we called him the energizer bunny because hmm. he would always you know it's like um i'm out here on the west coast and he was most of the time on the east coast and he would uh text us mac and i and uh he would say, uh, okay, boys, well, here's, what do you think of, let's do this Key West show, which was done in January of, um, or February of um, this past, this year. He said, uh, and it'd be like, it would be 4.30 my, I mean, no, it, yeah, it'd be 4.30 my time. And I would answer because I'd be up. And, uh, you know, it was just, um, he was always thinking about the next thing to do. The interesting thing about this album is that usually Mac and I would have a hard time keeping him focused to finish the album, hmm. to get the vocals done and without going to the next project, whatever that is. And uh, this one, that wasn't the case. He he just, uh, he did have a little bit. He said, well, we're going to tour, tour in August of, uh, you know, this year. And, uh, Maybe we'll, you know, do some dates down in the Carolinas. Hmm. Uh, but uh, did, doing this album, he just remained focused and he just, you know, kept rewriting the lyrics, constantly rewriting the lyrics. That's that's that was typical Jimmy, and uh, until he got it the way he wanted it, and um, and then our job was to be sure that his vocals, you know, the performances were there. And he might have given his best performance ever on Bubbles Up hmm. uh, th on this album. You know, I was getting a an email not long ago from, or a message, I should say. I don't know this man. He seemed like a very nice man. And he was commenting on some of the wonderful songs that Jimmy Buffett has written through the years. And it occurred to me that a number of them were ones that you co-wrote like No Plane on Sunday and mm -hmm. uh, Survive. Right. And I, I'm just, you are primarily a composer and not a lyricist, correct? No, yeah, that's com completely correct. Yeah. Do, you, I, 
You wrote some incredible songs, but I'm just curious, why didn't the two of you, it seems like after The Prince of Tides, you all didn't really co-write as much. Well, you know, he started writing with more with Roger and Pete and mm-hmm. Russ Kunkel. And uh, and he always wrote, you know, with Mac, uh, but they really started writing again together, um, you know, uh, on the last couple of projects. Uh, and um it just it, it was just time to to move on it's like even when we were doing um um floor days back in 1986 uh which is uh no plan on sunday is that correct that's correct yes yeah uh, and also uh but anyway uh, we were doing the album and and he said you know i want to i want to spread out i want you know spread out a little bit so he w- went up to New York and wrote with Ralph McDonald, Bill Eaton, and Bill Salters. You know, just he was always wanting to expand his horizons. And uh, it was just, you know, m- my job as a, for me, the way a, what a producer should do is Jimmy had already established himself as what he was, um, is to keep that in tow no matter what uh who was i know when we um after one particular harbor we were going to start do the album in los angeles uh the next album which became riddles in the sand uh but the they asked him to go back to nashville with jimmy bowen and jimmy asked me buffett asked me to come along and i was just sort of there to be sure that it it stayed in the the uh, the Jimmy Buffett genre, you know, uh, and uh, so those two albums, uh, uh, Riddles in the Sand and Last Mango, were um, were you know they, they I was more there just to uh, to keep the uh, style going of of his music going. Mm. Interesting. You know, I want to I want to touch on this just a bit. Um, it wasn't long after Jimmy Buffett's passing. I, w- I was listening to the the studio track of Last Mango in Paris, mm-hmm. and it was occurring to me what a unique melody, what a unique, unusual song. And I thought, you know. There's still so much to be done, that line. I thought, you know, yeah. this song just kind of encapsulates the entire Buffett mystique into one song. And that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that was, and that was done, <clears throat> that was started in Key West. Uh, the idea was started in Key West. The, uh, uh, but we didn't even write it until we got to Nashville for the session. So, you know, it's got the, the album's called Last Mango in Paris. But this is usually a lot of the time uh, things aren't written until you start the creative process. Hmm. The ideas are there and they get written. So but it, when we were, um, you know, Jimmy had that idea, Last uh, Mango in Paris. Uh, I got on the plane from Key West to um, Miami, because I couldn't get anywhere without going to Miami. It was, and I wrote the melody to the chorus and then came home and wrote the the, the verses. Uh, and then, so I had, the music was done, but none of the song had been written. While we're in Nashville, Will Jennings, Marshall Chapman, Jimmy and myself, go over to Will's apartment. He had taken an apartment there in Nashville. And uh, that's when the song was written. And the next day we recorded. So uh, and a lot of times it's just it things get written. Just like I said, Volcano got written because we were in Montserrat. And he, Keith Sykes and Jimmy uh, were up on that volcano. And what are we going to do when this thing blows, you know? <laughs> Did you... Did you meet the late subject of Last Mango in Paris, Captain Tony Terracino? Did you know? I him? sure did. Oh yeah, uh, I remember the last time I saw him. He came to a show in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand, 
And I looked out in the audience and he was with a lady. You know, Tony was probably, I don't know what he was when he passed, but uh, I, I, I'm, you know, in, in, in the travels in the into Key West, I saw him quite a bit. But the last time I saw him, he was with some young woman, uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, by his side, living the life. And uh, but that's who he was. You know, it's just uh, I think that's why Jimmy and uh, and Captain Tony had such an affinity for each other. They they sort of lived their life the same way. Right. Yeah. I remember every time he would see me in Key West, he would always go, hey, where's the crew? Every yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, of interesting characters throughout life and continuing, you have ran into some really interesting people. Like, okay, let's just name a few. You got to play the, uh, and you're from Arkansas, the President Clinton inaugural ball. Right, right. That, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with people like that. And then, you know, at the one particular harbor sessions, I think, yeah, Jack Nicholson comes into the studio and he, you know, is giving compliments to Earl Clue and Earl Clue is giving compliments to Jack Nicholson. Have you ever found yourself in a state of awe? Well, of course I have. I mean, because, you know, I I, I pinch myself because I've been so fortunate. You know, I, I try to, um, I always felt like, especially because we were working, it was, you know, I just, it's not, I try to not goo-goo-eye over these people. But yeah, yeah. And Harrison was there. He came by. Harrison Ford came by, you know, because these are all friends of Jimmy's. And, uh, and, um, and, you know, but I, I got to work with Barbara Streisand, you know, it, it, it was terrific on, on Star is Born. And of course my hero, cause as a kid, I told Roy this, Roy Orbison, mm. uh, at the, in, during the summer at the public pool of where I, in Blyville, Arkansas, where I grew up, they played Ooby Dooby all the time mm. on the jukebox. And that was Roy's first son record hit. And um, and it's funny when we, uh, I got to work with him do, uh, doing a, uh, a remake of his greatest hits. And one of those songs was uh, Ooby Dooby. And uh, Roy played the guitar solo. We were overdubbing. And, Roy, uh, and he played his guitar solo. And, I, and uh, he said, you know, the kids in England always said, Wow, this is amazing. And I said, Roy, it is amazing. You know, because <laughs> he always thought it was so simple. You know, it's rockabilly solo. But it was just to work with people, you know, for me to work with Aretha Franklin. Hmm. I mean, she was such a influence on me in my younger year. You know, I mean, I was an R&B guy, Ray Charles, Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin. And, you know, like I said, six months out of college, to be playing on the Spirit in the Dark album was uh, was was amazing. It kind of makes me think of this. Uh, you know, in addition to all the wonderful songs that Jimmy Buffett recorded that you co-wrote, you've had quite a list of artists who ended up recording a Michael Utley co-write. I, yeah. Yeah. You know, Crystal Gale. Right. Uh, the Neville Brothers, as well as Aaron Neville, La Vie Dansant. Right. Uh, and then, like, uh, not long ago, I was listening to a duet of Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson. And on the label, it said M. Utley. Yeah. Wow. How, how you feel like fooling around? Is that the one it was? It was from the movie. Uh, Stephen yeah. Bruton and Chris and I wrote it. So I got to, I mean, I've had, I've, I've, I've been in the presence of some great songwriters, you know, with Chris and uh, with Jimmy. Um, and, uh, just, and Will Jennings. Yeah. You know. it, has any of those recordings of your songs, like the Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Aaron, Neville, has any of those really knocked you out? Well, uh, yeah, they do. Oh, the funny story. Uh, I wrote with a guy, when I first moved to Memphis out of college, uh, Steve Bogart, who's been a very successful writer, uh, in his own right, and he lives in Nashville. And he and um 
he and I wrote a song. Our first song we wrote together was called Touch Me With Magic. And um, about, uh, I would say, well, that, that was in 1969. Uh, 1979, Billy Swan, who... Uh, um, who was a member of Chris's band and an artist too, um, calls me up and he says, Utley, you got a number one hit. What? I says, yeah. Um, um, it's on, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, El Paso, who uh, Marty Robbins yeah. has a hit on Touch Me With Magic. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a nice perk. A lot of people over the last couple of years, especially as Jimmy Buffett started to delve into his lesser known songs, they started pointing out, wow, what an underrated songwriter Mr. Buffett was. And, you know, with getting respect from people like Bob Dylan. Uh, and I wanted to kind of touch on this because I believe that Jimmy wasn't only an underrated songwriter. He was an underrated singer as well. Norbert Putnam one time came on here and he was talking about how he said, listen to the vocal on Coast of Marseille, man. And he said, tell me, is that not Bing Crosby-esque? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy is a tor was a torch singer. He, was, he knew how to work a crowd and he loved it. And, you know, all the stuff he did, like the, the Broadway musical stuff, mm -hmm. uh, he loved that, you know, and uh, he, um, but he had a, a vocal range. There was a certain area of his voice that, and uh, you can hear it in the song, uh, Pacing the Cage, and you hear it in, um, um and, and bubbles up this recent uh, single that he had with Will and uh, of Will and Jimmy Song, um, but uh, to go further with that, we were doing that video of uh, a Las Vegas show where uh, it was a, a DVD mm -hmm. uh, where uh, and I we were Mac and I were mixing it and uh, not not the video but doing the sound the audio. And uh, we were looking at the video and said, and I said, there's Jack Benny walking across the stage. He had such a command. Jimmy had such a command of sta the stage. He felt so comfortable up there, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And, That's you know, I tell you what, Meili Maka, Jimmy's version, is as good or better than Bing's, I think. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I saw this one little clip one time of you and and Buffett just together, and it looked like you were just kind of clowning around, you know, and he was kind of putting on this uh, kind of jazz inflection, and I, I played Stars Fell on Alabama for a really serious Sinatra historian, mm -hmm. and he said, man, who is, I didn't tell him who it was, and he said, who is this? This is a great singer. I said, you'll yeah. never guess. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. No, Jimmy was a fabulous singer. And he, he you know, and, he, you know, he was, he just did it on his own. He just, it was just a natural thing for him. Hmm. He had inflection and he could, you know, he was, he, he could, we, when we recorded him, we always tried to get a performance. Uh, the best we could, you know, we're, you know, in today's tech with, with today's technology, you know, you can do it line by line, you can do it syllable by syllable, but the performance was the key. And particularly with Jimmy, let, you know, let him go all the way through the song, let him have some passes. And, um, it, it, most of the time it just really worked out. The only time it, you know, he, sometimes he'd have to maybe, we'd have to come back in after he uh, lived with the song for a while. Hmm. I want to call the viewers and listeners out there. There's another interview with you that, that I recommend they watch. It's on your son and uh, 
daughter-in-law's show. It's a really interesting interview, and people will get to see you play a little of, it's like a professor long hair kind of thing, I think it was. Uh-huh. Uh, check out that interview, folks. But it made me kind of think, because, you know, like to me on lip service, you were kind of like doing a professor long hair kind of sound on that. Oh, yeah. It, have you ever thought about doing, or could we ever imagine one day, a Michael E. Utley solo record? Uh, yeah, but I, I still like doing records with Robert, Robert Greenwich. Yeah. He's, he, you know, he and I, re, we, uh, there's no reason why a guy from Arkansas and a kid from Port of Spain, Trinidad, would have such a, a com- a compa- a com- a compatible, you know, musical likeness, but we we do. And I think it's probably this whole thing. I mean, Jimmy always talked about New Orleans being the northernmost point of the Caribbean, and that's so true. And I, you know, that's, I I feel that way too. And, and New Orleans was such a big influence on me, even though I was from the Memphis area where you know, the, the whole Stacks, Booker T, who I, who's, uh, you know, Booker T Jones, who I, was my mentor and, and, uh, and, and he's my friend, you know, I'd have to work with him and, and play on some of his records. But, um, uh, but no, New Orleans was, you know, and, and I got to, and while I was in Miami, I got to work with Mac Rabinac, Dr. John. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, in fact, we were both on that Buddy Guy record together. I was playing organ or piano, and he was playing. If I was playing piano, he'd be playing guitar, and I, if he was playing piano, I'd play organ. And um, so it was, uh, new, yeah. But I, I, I might do it. I don't know. To get back to the question, would I ever do a solo record? Um, I might, but uh, I still really enjoy working with Robert. Well, those Club Trini records are pretty magical. They're they're wonderful and soothing and exciting at the same time to listen to. I saw the news about Little Flock Music uh, bringing Club Trini on board. Do you think there'll be a Club Trini record coming down well, the pipe? Robert, yes, Robert and I talked about doing that. It's just a question of, you know, we're just still sort of getting, our, you know, over – everything's going to be after the first of the year. And, uh, you know, and Robert's always busy uh, in Trinidad in January and February, usually. So it would be after that, but we'll, we'll be talking. Yeah. I would love to. Yeah. You know, that brings up an interesting question. I think about how little feet after Lowell George passed, they continued on. Do you think that the Coral Reefer band, I mean, you all have six vocalists. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you think you all could con- or are likely to keep going? Well, there's Jimmy, that's what his wish. We, you know, when we, Mac and I went and saw him right before he, his passing, and uh, he wants it, to, he's always wanted that, but he reiterated that he wants the, the band to stay together, and, you know, and just to keep it going. And, and so, and like I said, that's that's going to be talked about after the first year. Um, and there, you know, there there'll be some. I'm, I'm not sure what they are, but there's some talk of some things happening with the band. But I mean, actually, going out and and you know, and and continuing the music and Great. the legacy. Yeah. What are you most proud of? Uh, of you mean musically, just anything in your life <laughs> that I've been. I what am I proud of? That I've got. Well, I'm. I don't know if this is. Well, I've got some, everyone I ever worked with became really dear friends, and that's uh, you know that because because of egos and. Uh, that some people it get that it gets in the way of friendships, but I've just been lucky to, and I never expected it, you know, that to work with Jimmy 50 years, you know, I, I never expected to work with Rita. I mean, I remember the days I met these people, 
and uh, for such a long time, and for and to work with Chris and Dan Fogelberg, and um, I'm just I'm just thankful that uh, that that the people I got to work with, you know, it's just it, it became more than just making music together. My last question, as we pass, as we part here for now, this is a serious question. I'm I'm being serious here. Okay. Do you and the members of the Coral Reefer Band, the Club Trini, Peter Mayer, do do you all know what this music means to people? Believe it or not, I think I do because mm -hmm. I just I was walking our puppy dogs in the neighborhood where I live. And uh, a friend, a neighbor came up and he had a friend with him. And I could see it on his face, how, mu how much gratitude he had uh, to, um, you know, what it meant, what Jimmy's music meant to, to him. And uh, I, I used to see it all the time. It's particularly when we were doing things like Meeting in the Mind, where we could actually see uh, uh, the people and talk to them, they would say, you don't know how much it changed my life. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Jimmy taught us, have a good time, hmm. enjoy life, enjoy life to the fullest. That's a great place to close. Okay. Well, Mr. Utley, cheers to you. I've got my coffee here, but, uh, well, Paul, always, nice to talk to you again. Always great to talk to you. Yeah. So how long have you been in uh, Charleston? I know it's been a while. Oh, I've been here now um, a year and a half so yeah. far. Yeah. I love it. I think maybe, um, yeah. But uh, so are you in downtown or are you? where are you? I'm uh, maybe 10 minutes outside of downtown. Okay. A little, uh, little quiet area. Okay, nice. It's a great town. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Just love it. Yeah. Well, Mr. Udley, I, I hope you have a great evening, a great supper. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> until next time. All right. I hope to see you play oh. live music. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep living and enjoying life. <laughs> That's great. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We thank you and appreciate you dropping in for the Paul Leslie Hour today. You know, you can help the Paul Leslie Hour in our mission to provide independent media content like this by visiting www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. We truly thank you. This is your announcer speaking. Performance of The Entertainer intro song and Corina Corina outro song, courtesy of John Primerano. Well, that's it for today. So until next time, be safe and be good.